God bless America. Join me as we have a double hitter as we talk about the founding of America and President's Day coming up next on this special edition of The Right Stuff. Welcome to The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we are going to have a blast as we delve through history. This is a double header. The first part of our God Bless America special edition, we're going to be talking about the founding of the country with my guest, Professor Jean-Pierre Isbots. You can view his presentation on my YouTube channel by simply going to PJC Media on YouTube and take a look at it. It's a presentation about 40 minutes. He has some of the most gorgeous maps you've ever seen of what America represented it represented to Europeans who were traveling over to the New World. And you can see through these maps the growth of a nation. I would love to get your response to that. So make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and look at that presentation. Then we're going to be talking to my guest co-host today, Lewis Smith. You know him for a long time. He's been on this show several times. Last year, we talked about President's Day as we went through the first president down to the last president of the 19th century. Now we're going to continue that discussion this year as we go through not all, but some of the presidents of the 20th and 21st century. Can't wait to tell you all about it in just a few moments. As always, we want to thank our Patreon team for their support. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. Simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we cover your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net. Click on that pink follow button and you'll never, ever have to miss a show. And so, without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest on today, Lewis Smith. Professor, how you doing? Hey, Parker. How you doing tonight? I am so glad to have you on the show. You know I enjoy you every single time we do. Last year, I so enjoyed our conversation for President's Day that I was able to implement some of the things you said into one of my books. So I wonder what's going to happen today as we go through the rest of the presidents of the USA up until about the 21st century. I think it'll be a lot of fun. There's some interesting characters that have held that office in the last hundred years. If we want to give people the Cliff Notes version of you, go ahead and tell them what that is. Okay, well, I am a 30-year history teacher, and I am a novelist. I have uh, six books in print right now. My most recent was called President Hamilton. It's an alternative history of what might have happened if Alexander Hamilton had not been killed in the famous duel with Aaron Burr. Um, and so I've uh, been married for uh, almost 40 years to my wife, Patty. Uh, father of twin daughters. They're both grown and married now. And uh, I'm also an avid artifact collector. You can follow me uh, on Facebook. And also I have my own YouTube channel also called Indiana Smith, which is mainly about my uh, my artifact adventures. But that's just a, a little bit of who I am and what I do. One thing about your YouTube channel is that people have an opportunity to follow you on your search what has been some of the responses you've received from people who watch your channel? Oh, I get all sorts of interesting comments from folks. You know, I get out and look for a lot of artifacts and fossils. I found some really cool things in the process and got to meet some fascinating people. Uh, this summer, I recovered everything from a partial skeleton of a mosasaur, which is a giant prehistoric sea lizard. Uh, to an almost intact Caddo pot that was exposed by erosion at a local site I visit. So it's been a really interesting year for artifacts and always looking forward to the new year. One thing, too, is that you also have a blog. Do you keep that updated regularly? I have kind of neglected it lately. The last thing I put up there, though, was a sneak peek at my current book in progress. I actually got so enthused by the thought of, you know, sparing Hamilton and seeing him live on to become president. My new project is uh, set during the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction and answers something Americans have always wondered, how different would things have been if Abraham Lincoln had not died at Ford's Theater? I'm about two-thirds of the way through that story now. <laughs> 
One thing about these interesting scenarios is that you try to extrapolate a person's character through the things they leave behind. What are some of those things that you have picked up on as you begin that journey with this alternate history? Well, I try to get to know the person. And of course, uh, Lincoln and Hamilton were two kind of historical heroes of mine anyway. I usually read multiple biographies of the person involved and try to read some of their letters and papers and get a feel for their voice and their character and the kind of person they were, and then work forward from there. What would they have done? How would they have reacted in this scenario? How different would history have been if they had not been taken from us prematurely? One of the aspects of what you do is that you do take these very interesting and provocative thoughts and create a wonderful narrative from them. When you were on the show before, we talked about President Hamilton. And from that, a lot of things came to be. We learned how revisionist history works because now President Hamilton is being viewed in a way different way than maybe he would have been viewed a few years back due to the success of Disney's Hamilton. And now you got Lincoln and Lincoln is a very controversial subject anyway, because some people say he had different motivations for the civil war. It doesn't matter, but what it is is that we learn from history. In this talk today, which is part of our God Bless America special edition of Right Stuff, we want to focus on the presidents. And from last year, let's just do a quick recap of the presidents and how they came to be. And then we're going to go through the list of presidents up into the 21st century. Well, we've never really had a constitutional republic with a president at its head in world history. I mean, the longest lasting republic ever was the Roman Republic, and the founders borrowed some ideas from there. And in the president, they combined some of the powers of the consuls and some of the powers of the tribune of the plebs, and they created a unique office that would be very powerful and yet at the same time constrained by the Constitution and also would have two co-equal branches of government and all three were designed to provide each other with checks and balances to have their powers separated among them. And really... There was a great fear of centralized power among many of the founders because they had just broken away from the very powerful nation of Great Britain. And so they went back and forth over what kind of powers the president would have. But one thing everybody agreed on, there was only one man who could be the first president, and that was George Washington. They knew they could trust him with power because he had been given the chance to make himself a king during the revolution and had turned it down. He had disbanded the army, returned his sword to Congress, and retired to his farm. So they knew that he would be the first president, and in taking that office, he basically had a one-page job description in the Constitution to work from, and from that, he created the presidency as we have it now. And in everything that he did, he set this pattern for all those who would hold the office after him. And one of the most important precedents, he said, was stepping down after eight years, after two terms of office. He stepped down, and Jefferson and Adams ran for the second presidency. Adams won in 1796. He had a rather frustrated presidency with troubles at home and troubles abroad and wound up being our first one-term president. And then you had Jefferson, who had a very different view of the presidency, driven much more by popular opinion. And it was really under him that you see the beginning of the popular presidency over, or maybe the Democratic presidency, as some would term it, over the constitutional presidency. And this was carried forward by Madison and Monroe. And then you had John Quincy Adams, who was uniquely, brilliantly qualified for the office and yet wound up winning in an election that many considered to be tainted and was never given an effective chance to govern. Uh, then Andrew Jackson came along, and Jackson was the one who really democratized and popularized the presidency. And Andrew Jackson is a very controversial figure today because. A, he was a Tennessee slaveholder, and B, because of his dealings with the Native Americans, but he certainly did transform the presidents. Uh, he was a man who was strongly driven by his passions, and also he was very much believed that the presidency was an office of the people, uh, and that he was the tribune of the people. Uh, and then going forward from Jackson, he had kind of a string of mediocrities there in the 1840s and 50s, with the exception of James K. Polk who is almost forgotten today, but was a very consequential president, led us through one of our first foreign wars, the Mexican-American War, added an enormous amount of territory to the Union, 
made six campaign promises, kept all of them, and then stepped out at the end of his first term and died almost immediately after. Uh, after Polk, you have a string of some of the worst presidents in American history. And then, of course, the greatest, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I could go on about him all night. Lincoln is, to me, not just our greatest president, but probably the greatest American who ever lived. I have an enormous, enormous admiration for him. And it's really just kind of getting back to my current book in progress. It is a very daunting task to undertake to rewrite what Lincoln's second term would have looked like if he had had a chance to finish serving it. Unfortunately, Lincoln was taken from us prematurely at the end of the Civil War. You had Andrew Johnson, who is universally scored as one of the worst presidents in American history and who really squandered whatever opportunity the Civil War gave us to establish racial equality in America and certainly helped set the nation on the path to Jim Crow. Uh, after him, you had Grant, who was considerably better, remarkably better on civil rights, but unfortunately, the resistance had already dug in at that point. And after Grant, a succession of uh, Gilded Age presidents, uh, some of whom were fascinating in their own right. Grover Cleveland's an interesting fellow, to be sure. Uh, but none of them really shine out historically. You know, most of the guys of the Gilded Age are the presidents today no one's heard of. Chester A. Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland. No one really remembers them. And in 1896, you have the election of William McKinley. Uh, who was a congressman from Ohio. He led America through another triumphant foreign war, the Spanish-American War of 1898, uh, which at the time was called a splendid little war uh, by his Secretary of State, uh, John Hay. And then in 1901, that brings us up to the 20th century, where we're launched tonight. Uh, President McKinley, having just secured re-election, went to visit the World's Fair in Buffalo, New York, and was shot by a crazed assassin, and that put his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, into the White House at the age of 42, the youngest president in American history, and a man that none of the party bosses wanted to be president. And yet he emerges as the first modern president and radically transforms both the office and our, the way we view our government. Not only was he the president of the modern era, he sort of began to be a symbol of man. So when we talk about Theodore Roosevelt, not only is he the president who no one expected to be the president, but he also brought in a different view of the presidency during this time. What would you say that would be? Well, he took a very, shall we say, broad construction of the Constitution. His attitude was, unless the Constitution specifically told him he couldn't do it, uh, that it was probably within his means to go after it. He was very young, very energetic. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt was just this uh, almost, I'm trying to think of anyone in our time that had the same level of energy. And the person who reminds me of him a little bit is Steve Irwin. If you remember the old crocodile hunter from Animal Planet. Yeah. Uh, reminds of that same kind of manic energy and that same positive masculinity. And that's Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, this was a guy suffered from asthma as a kid and finally just decided, you know what, I'm not going to let this control my life. He would run until he ran out of breath. He would fall on the ground gasping for breath. And then when he got his breath back, he would get up and run some more. He took up boxing, weightlifting, expanding the muscles of his chest to make his lungs stronger. Uh, and just became this incredible dynamo of a person. Uh, suffered a very tragic loss early in his life. Uh, his wife and mother died the same night. His mother died of a cholera epidemic that was sweeping New York, and his wife uh, died in childbirth the same evening. And it devastated him so much, he went out west to become a rancher, uh, stayed there a couple of years until that horrible winter of 1887-88 pretty well wiped out his ranch. Uh, but while it was there, he did manage to pretty much single-handedly save the American bison from extinction. He was a, a great hunter and conservationist, but when he got out to the West, the vast herds of buffalo numbered in the millions just a few years before were down to about 300. So he got with several other ranchers and they trapped a little over 100 bison and released them into Yellowstone National Park. And almost every American bison alive today is descended from that Yellowstone herd. And if Roosevelt had not intervened and encouraged others to intervene, the bison might well have gone extinct. Yeah, Roosevelt takes a very big view of the presidency. 
probably one of his biggest legacies was the Panama Canal. He negotiated the Canal Treaty. He was the first president to win both the Medal of Honor and the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, and then his biggest mistake, though, Roosevelt said this himself, when he was running for a term of his own in 1904, somebody asked if that would be his last term. And he said, well, he said, I will regard President McKinley's term, of which I served three and a half years, as a full term of office. And at the end of this term, I will follow George Washington's precedent and step down. He later said he would cut his right arm off to take that speech back because he loved being president. But in 1908, he did step down as he had promised. Uh, and uh, he was only 50 years old when he left the presidency. That's something to think about, too. He was still a relatively young man. Uh, but Taft was kind of his handpicked successor. Taft did not particularly want to be president. His goal, what he dreamed of, was being on the Supreme Court. That's kind of funny. Taft was actually pretty progressive in his policies, but he was not a very good politician, and he did not deal well with the progressives in Congress. And they, uh, after suffering a couple of defeats on key issues where they thought Taft could have helped them and didn't, they went running to catch up to Theodore Roosevelt, who was on an African hunting safari, and told him that Taft had betrayed his legacy and was turning the party back over to the old guard and the bosses and the corrupt politicians who had come before. So Roosevelt comes back to America, kind of watches things for a while, and then decides, you know, I did promise not to serve another consecutive term. I didn't say anything about coming back. And so he came back in 1912, and you wind up having a three-way race for the White House because Taft is trying to get reelected. Roosevelt first tried to win the Republican nomination away from Taft. Taft fought him on it tooth and nail. And when Roosevelt didn't have enough delegates at the convention to get the nomination, he stormed out and formed his own party, the Progressive Party, and took over half the Republicans with him. And that opened the door for the Democrats. Uh, and that's one of the more famous Theodore Roosevelt stories came out of that 1912 campaign. Roosevelt was uh, getting off of the train to give a speech, and this crazed would-be assassin shot him in the chest. Oh, well, my. The assassin was tackled by the crowd. Uh, I mean, he was just truly nuts. I forget his rationale for attacking Roosevelt. Roosevelt, the his glasses case and the folded-up copy of his speech in his pocket had stopped the bullet from penetrating his chest cavity. Oh, it my was goodness. It was his ribs. He went into the uh, community hall where he was speaking and gave his speech with a bullet in his chest. <laughs> oh my gosh! He spoke for a full hour, and wow. then it was steadily getting weaker and paler as he spoke. And finally, said, "That's all I've got to say. Doctors, do your worst." And sat down and let them tend to him. And uh, everyone in the race took a two-week break from campaigning while Roosevelt recovered. But in the end, Woodrow Wilson got 42% of the vote. Roosevelt got about 30-something percent of the vote. William Howard Taft, the incumbent president, as he later put it, was elected ex-president by the largest margin in American history. He only got 23% of the vote. Wow. Although the next Republican president, Warren G. Harding, did appoint Taft to the Supreme Court, and Taft is the only person who has served as both President of the United States and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Now, sandwiched in between that, though, you've got the presidents of Woodrow Wilson, and today he's best remembered as the man who led America through World War I. Although, when the war began, when the war began in 1914, Rosa, uh, Wilson wanted to keep America out of it. Matter of fact, he campaigned for re-election with the campaign promise he kept us out of war. But then in his second term, there were a series of things. Uh, the Zimmerman telegram, for one thing, the Germans resuming uh, unrestricted submarine warfare against neutral ships. And so in April 1917, Wilson did go to the Congress and ask for a declaration of war, and America got into World War I. Wilson is, he is a, a an interesting president to study. I mean, he had a tremendous progressive agenda. He got a bunch of great reforms passed, helped in child labor, did a lot of things that the progressive movement had been after, created the Securities and Exchange Commission, 
or no, not that, the, the Federal Reserve to help regulate the money supply, control the banking system. And yet he was the most racist president of the 20th century. He took the one workplace in America that was integrated and resegregated it. That was the federal civil service. Up to that point, you'd have blacks and whites working side by side in government offices. He segregated them again. And then during the war, led one of the most systematic assaults on civil rights and freedom of speech in American history. His Sedition Act pretty much made it a crime to criticize the administration or to criticize the war. And a lot of opposition leaders who were against America's involvement in the war were fined, jailed, or just bullied into silence. Uh, and then at the end of the war, of course, he had his 14 points for peace, one of which was a League of Nations. And he personally went to Europe. He was the first president to visit Europe during his term of office to help negotiate the treaty that ended World War I, brought the treaty back to the United States Senate. The problem was during the November 1918 election, the Republicans had taken over Congress. They did not appreciate the fact that Wilson went to France to negotiate this treaty and did not take a single Republican member of the Senate with him, did not put them in the loop. And in the end, they wound up rejecting the treaty that he negotiated. The Treaty of Versailles was never ratified with the United States, and the United States never joined the League of Nations, which was one reason that it failed. Uh, and Wilson got very worked up about that. He went on a speaking tour of the United States to promote the treaty and suffered a stroke in the middle of that that left him bedridden for six weeks. And during that time, his wife pretty much ran the country. He held oh, no my. cabinet meetings. No, she would go in and talk to him because he could not even speak coherently, but she said she could still understand him. And she would bring what she said were his orders back out to the cabinet. And it wasn't uh, when he, after six weeks, when he finally was able to attend a cabinet meeting, he was just a pale shadow of his former self. It never really did recover his health fully and died about four or five years after leaving office. Um, so the 1920 election wound up being between Warren G. Harding of Ohio and uh, Samuel Cox. And uh, Harding, who had a habit of horribly mauling the English language, uh, one of his things was that America needed not nostrums, but normalcy. Normalcy wasn't even a word. The word is normality. But oh return, to, return to normalcy became the campaign slogan of the Republicans. And pretty much America was tired of progressivism, tired of reforms, and tired of being uh, of internationalism. The country wanted to retreat back into isolationism and kind of close its eyes and go back to sleep. And Harding was the guy for that. You know, he was elected. And basically, he was like a small town mayor who had gotten elected to the Senate. He was the owner of a local newspaper. And uh, he was quite popular with the people. He was well liked. And, uh, you know, the thing about Harding is that he was, uh, oh gosh, well, see, it was the age of prohibition, but he still kept a fifth of whiskey at the White House desk. When congressmen and senators came over, he would pour them a drink and said, gentlemen, let's strike a blow for freedom. Uh, That's and, awesome. Uh, that would be like a president uh, in the nineties, keeping a, a joint. Yeah, the, that's what I'm saying. That's awesome. You know, because it was actually illegal to consume. Uh, he loved a good game of poker. And uh, at least there's a great deal of debate. There was a woman who claimed to have been Harding's lover the whole time he was in office and to have had a child by him. Some modern historians have questioned whether she was being truthful about that. But nonetheless, uh, he was known to have run around on his wife. And then there were a bunch of scandals in his administration, not with him, but with his cabinet members. Two of his cabinet members went to jail, and the stress of it drove Warren Harding into a heart attack, and he died in 1923 before his term of office was even over. And that left him to be succeeded by Calvin Coolidge of Massachusetts, who had been the governor of Massachusetts and was the vice president, and he became president in 1924. Now, Calvin Coolidge is a hoot. Uh, he slept more and did less than any president in American history. Oh, my. He would get up at 9 o'clock in the morning, go to the Oval Office, you know, he'd eat breakfast, be in the Oval Office by about 10, sign bills and papers for a couple of hours, go to lunch, come back from lunch, work for another hour or so, and usually about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, he would lean back in his chair, put, put his feet up in the desk, close his eyes, and doze off. 
the Secret Service would wake him up at five o'clock and tell him it was time for supper. And he would always open one eye and say, is the country still here? <laughs> well, it's a valid question if he just had a nap. <laughs> well, the thing is, of course, the president didn't do nearly as much back then. It was a calm, peaceful, sleepy era. And uh, one man said the country wanted nothing done and Calvin Coolidge was the man to do it. Nice. Nice. That is burn. <laughs> his nickname was Silent Cal because he never talked. Uh, one of his mottos was nothing I never said ever hurt. <laughs> and so he was a master of just keeping his mouth shut. There's there's so many great stories about Calvin Coolidge. Uh, a young Washington socialite got a seat across the table from him at a state dinner. She leaned across the table and said, Mr. President, I bet my best friend that I could get more than two words out of you this evening. Coolidge calmly looked at her, raised one eyebrow, and said, you lose, and didn't <laughs> speak to her again all the <laughs> But this is my favorite Calvin Coolidge story. I always tell this one to my history classes. Uh, one morning, his wife was ill, and he went to church without her while he was president. He came back and sat down to read the morning newspaper, and his wife said, Calvin, how was church today? And he lowered the newspaper and looked at her for a moment and said, fine, and went back to his newspaper. And she said, Calvin, tell me what the preacher preached about. He looked around his newspaper and said, sin. <laughs> and went back to reading the newspaper. And at this point, she kind of pulled the paper down and said, uh, all right, Calvin Coolidge, tell me, what did he have to say about sin? And Coolidge thought about it for a minute and said, he was against it. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> let me read my paper. <laughs> I now, love that. He was tremendously popular, and he had been president. And, and that's the thing America loved this funny, quiet, sleepy little man at the White House. Uh, he was one of the most popular presidents of the time. And of course, that was the late 20s. The stock market was going through the roof. Everybody was throwing all their money into stocks and getting rich. It was the age of gin joints and flappers and jazz and all of this stuff going on. And in 1928, Coolidge summoned a press conference. And as was typical, he made one statement and took no questions. He said, I do not choose to run for president in the year 1928. Kind of surprised everybody because people just assumed he was going to run for re-election. Uh, but he, he, you know, after winning a term of his own at 24, he could have been president for nine years, but no, he stepped down. And so they nominated Herbert Hoover. I've always felt kind of sorry for Herbert Hoover because his name became a cuss word during the Great Depression. Oh my. But really, he inherited an economy that was already riding for a fall and no one knew it. And part of it was his, oh, his inaugural address. He said that, I believe we are closer than we have ever been to the final eradication of poverty from our land. And he had about six good months where the stock market kept shooting up and everyone was doing well. And America was just kind of just loving that whole late 20s vibe. And then Black Tuesday came along October 28, 1929. The stock market crashed. Oh, gosh, what was it? Uh Eight million shares of stock traded in a single day for a debt loss of ten billion dollars. Oh my! It was, uh, and the bottom dropped out. And as uh, the comedian Will Rogers put it, Wall Street had a nightmare, and the whole country woke up screaming. Wow! And wow. probably the biggest thing back then was there was no such thing as deposit insurance. And you know, banks only keep about twenty percent of their total holdings in house. They load the rest out. That's how they make their money. But if everybody decides to pull their money out of the bank at the same time and the bank doesn't have enough money to cover those withdrawals, the bank would shut its doors and close down. And people whose money was in savings accounts would lose their life savings. And there was no remedy for it. There was no recall. And between October of 1929 and March of 1933, over 6,000 banks failed nationwide. 100,000 jobs lost per week. Businesses shut down. I mean, it truly was the Great Depression. It was horrible. And poor old Hoover caught all the blame because he was of that old school of thought that it wasn't the government's place to help the citizen. You know, 
the government doesn't support the citizen. The citizen supports the government. And he believed that creating any kind of a dole or a, a welfare system would just suck out the work ethic and destroy the nation. So he just kept making these sunny, optimistic predictions that never came through. You know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Prosperity is hovering around the corner. And it never came true. So uh, the shanty towns that homeless people lived in were called Hoovervilles. Uh, a piece of bread folded over with nothing inside was a Hoover sandwich. Uh, the newspapers that hobos covered themselves up with to sleep at night, that was a Hoover blanket. Uh, I mean, he just became the most hated man in America. And then in the summer of 1932, the thing that just absolutely put a stake through the heart of his presidency, uh, a bunch of World War I veterans came to Washington because They've been given these government bonds as a reward for their service during the war that was supposed to mature in uh, 20 years, which would have been 1938 or 37 for some of them. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to cash in these bonds early because they had lost their jobs and had no money. Well, Congress uh, voted on the petition and voted it down. And the president let people convince him that these weren't real veterans. They were, you know, anarchist and communist agitators. So he sent the army in to clean out their homeless camp and drive them out of Washington. It was a fiasco. These guys who had served in World War I, many of them decorated veterans, were tear gassed and assaulted. And then the little tent city that they had put up about where the big reflecting pool in Washington is today was actually set on fire by the U.S. Army. And so they lost what few possessions they had. And then Hoover, who was privately horrified by this, because this was way overboard from what he had asked the Army to do, nonetheless, he wouldn't hang his chief of staff of the Army out to dry. So he publicly uh, just uh, said, well, you know, they, they were agitators and we had to get them out of the city. And that just killed his popularity. So in 32, he was gone. That, that was just pretty much a preordained conclusion. And the guy that ran was a man with the famous name, Franklin Roosevelt. He was a cousin of Theodore Roosevelt's, and he was the governor of New York. And Roosevelt, at the Democratic convention that year, he said, I pledge my administration, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. I'm seeing a shift from Hoover to Roosevelt that I think continues on through to the 21st century about what the president uh, does for the people. Would that be accurate? Oh, yeah, Roosevelt completely transformed not just the relation of the president to the American people. He transformed our whole relationship with our government. Okay. Because this idea that the government should not reach out and help people, he threw that sucker right out the window. Uh, and that was the thing. People didn't know what the New Deal was, but they knew that they did not like the old deal. And so when Roosevelt, uh, and, and I will say the man was a genius, and Truthfully, uh, the, the, the quote that sticks with me from Roosevelt, on the night he was inaugurated, uh, a guest at one of the presidential inaugural balls said, Mr. President, if you can end this depression, you'll go down as the greatest president in American history. And he said, Madam, if I don't do something about this depression, I will be the last president this country has. Hmm. And that, that wasn't just hyperbole. Around the world, 27 democracies collapsed in the wake wow. of the Great Depression. Matter of wow. fact, the same, uh, within a month of Roosevelt's coming to power in America just a few weeks earlier, Hitler had come to power in Germany. Both of them propelled into office by a reaction to this horrible economic crisis that was going on. Because it was worldwide. It wasn't just America. Uh, but Roosevelt stepped in and literally on the first day of his presidency, and he understood how to make things seem all right. He had a very reassuring voice. He had this electric smile that could light up a room. And so he announced, he could have said, we're closing all the banks for four days. And it would have triggered a panic. He said, we're going to declare a four-day bank holiday while Congress and I get together and try to come up with a way to make things better. And so what he passed through was the Emergency Banking Act, which created the FDIC program which is still around. I mean, you still see the FDIC sticker on the door of every bank you walk in through. And what it did was it federally insured all bank deposits up to the amount of $10,000. Hmm. 
And he created that, and then he went on the radio on his fourth day, and uh, he uh, sat in front of a fireplace in the White House, pulled a big mic up next show, and gave a broadcast to the American people. And this was the first time. Now, presidential speeches have been broadcast on occasion before, but this was the first time a president used the radio to talk directly to the American people. And my dad can remember because my family was too poor to own a radio. But dad told me they had a neighbor down the road, about four miles down the road, who had a great big old Philco radio. And when the president was speaking, they would send it in the window of their home and turn it out to the lawn. And neighbors would come from far away to sit on their lawn just to listen to the president. That's how novel and new it was. If I may add my little historical part to that, my grandmother talked about listening to President Roosevelt as a girl herself. And she talked about how she used to listen him listen to him on the radio. He would talk to the people, as she said. So I can really see that bridge connection President Roosevelt built with the American people. Oh, yes. And the thing is, they trusted him. Um, matter of fact, uh, when he went on the radio after that four-day bank holiday, uh, there was a fireplace nearby, and the sound technician said, Mr. President, I'm picking up the crackling of the fire in the background. Do you want to scoot your chair further back? He said, no, leave it. It, it sounds homey. And so they came to be called his fireside chats. Okay. And over the course of his 12 years in office, he would broadcast 40 of them. Um, so he talked to the American people on a pretty regular basis. But what he said that day is, your money is now safe in the bank. It's safer in the bank than it is buried in your yard. It's safer in the bank than it is stuffed under your mattress. Your banks are not going to fail. And if they do, your deposit is guaranteed up to $10,000 by the authority of the federal government itself. Your money will not disappear. It will not go away. And the next day, when the banks reopened for the first time in four years, deposits outnumbered withdrawals. And not only that, bank failures over the next year dropped by 90%. Hmm. That was a new deal. <laughs> yeah, well, that was just one part of it. I mean, okay. Roosevelt created all these, I mean, Social Security was part of the new deal that is still with us today. The Tennessee Valley Authority, the Rural Electrification Act. When Roosevelt took office, 50% of rural homes in America had electricity. Uh, by the time he ran for re-election the third time in 1940, uh, 85% of rural homes had electricity. I mean, it's just a, a, he, the stuff he did. People will say, well, the New Deal did not end the Depression. And that's true, it did not. But it made the Depression more tolerable. It helped the people who needed help the worst, and it gave them something to believe in. Uh, and so Roosevelt was riding, uh, at the end of his second term, was still riding a pretty good wave of popularity. And by then, of course, World War II had broke out in Europe. And so Roosevelt, in 1940, made the unprecedented decision to run for a third straight term of office. It was not illegal. The 22nd Amendment had not yet been passed, but it was unprecedented. But not only did he run, he won. Uh, he won a third term as president, and then, of course, he Roosevelt recognized the dangers of Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, but America was very isolationist. He tried to nudge us towards war, and he did manage to get the Lindley's program passed so we could help the British out in their struggle against Hitler. But Americans did not get behind us going to war until after Pearl Harbor, which was, uh, you know, that was almost a year into Roosevelt's third term. Uh, but then he led America through the war. And in 1944, even though he was dying and everybody close to him knew he was dying, he insisted on running again because he was afraid that the country would go back into the hands of isolationist Republicans uh, after the war. And, you know, in his view, the Second World War had happened largely because America had retreated into itself, not been involved in the world stage, not joined the League of Nations. He didn't want that to happen. So. He ran for a fourth term. However, the Democratic National Committee looked at his vice president, Henry Wallace, and said, eh, this guy is a little bit too comfortable with Stalin and communism. And so they booted Henry Wallace out at the Democratic National Convention and put a Missouri senator named Harry Truman in. And Roosevelt won that fourth term. The only man to 
be elected president four times, uh, won that election in November of 1944, and in April of 1945, as the war in Europe was winding down uh, and as the Manhattan Project was nearing its completion, Franklin Roosevelt suffered a fatal brain embolism and died, and Harry Truman became our next president. Now, when we look at this, one of the things that comes to mind about his presidency is that that generation had a different ethic than generations that will come after it. Do you think it is because they had a strong leader who worked with them through a very difficult time? And I think of my grandmother, I think of my husband's grandmother, they both lived during the depression and they both had the same sort of work ethic, even though they were at two opposite ends of the spectrum. And they both kept things. They both kept things forever. <laughs> and they would can things and do certain things. Do you think it's because the nation under FDR was completely supported by such a strong leader? I think that is a part of it. I mean, the greatest generation, as we call them, they are a different bunch. You know, they are, uh, uh, anyway, uh, and part of it was they had this unique relationship with President Roosevelt. Now, I think part of it is, I mean, they were born in the wake of World War One. They came of age in the Great Depression. And in their 20s, they were saving the world from fascism. And then they came back from the war and rolled up their sleeves and went to work because that was what they did. I mean, they were just, uh, they were a remarkable group of people. And certainly, uh, you know, Roosevelt, I remember my dad, dad was born in 1926. So he was six years old when Roosevelt was elected, and he was uh, 18 years old, almost 19, and a soldier when Roosevelt died. So that was really the only president he remembered up until the time he was nearly 19. I see. But uh, so Harry Truman takes over, and Truman is, I love this guy. He's one of my favorite presidents. He was a tough little haberdasher from Independence, Missouri. He owned a men's clothing store uh, and uh, had gotten elected county judge and then to the senator. And it's kind of interesting. He came for a gym, from a Jim Crow state, and yet he wound up taking a strong stand for racial equality. Uh, he came from a very corrupt political machine that nominated him as county judge and then as senator. And yet as president, he's one of the most honest men ever to hold the office. He was feisty. He was down to earth. I mean, he was basically the Midwest personified. Okay. You know, when World War I broke out, he was 34 years old. He didn't have to go. He was 34 and married. He volunteered anyway, became an artillery captain, served on the Western Front, came home, uh, made a good life with his uh, wife, Bess Truman, and now he's thrust into the presidency. And one of the things I love about Harry Truman, his first press conference uh, he announced the death of President Roosevelt. He announced that he had been sworn in. And then he looked at the reporters and said, boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I feel like the weight of the sun and the moon and all of the stars has just descended on my shoulders. Wow. But, you know, he led the country out of World War II. He made the momentous decision to use the atomic bomb against Japan. Uh, he met Stalin at the Yalta Conference. He took a strong stand for democracy. And when Stalin was trying to push into Eastern Europe, he stood up to him. Uh, you know, the Truman Doctrine was that we would go and aid pe free people anywhere in the world that was struggling against armed subjugation. He was the president who desegregated the armed forces. He created NATO, uh, the most successful defensive alliance in history. And he also... Uh, created the Marshall Plan, which helped rebuild Western Europe into a strong, vital system instead of seeing it fall into revolution and anarchy like much of Eastern Europe it did. You know, Winston Churchill once told Truman, Sir, I had great reservations about you assuming the presidency upon the death of my friend Franklin Roosevelt. He said, It gives me pleasure to inform you how wrong I was. In my view, you more than anyone else have saved the world. Wow. That's a lot coming from Churchill. Yeah, uh, yeah, it truly is. I mean, Churchill, uh, <laughs> a funny story about Truman and Churchill. 
Uh, you know, Churchill got voted out of it at the end of World War II, but came back as prime minister in 1950. During that five-year interim during Truman's presidency, he was visiting the United States, and they were taking the presidential train from Washington, D.C. to Missouri, where Churchill was going to speak. And so Truman was teaching Churchill how to play poker. And there were a couple of reporters in there that joined him. So it was four people for the poker game. And Churchill did not know poker at all and was not doing very well in the game. He excused himself to go to the lavatory. And one of the journalists, Hugh Side, he said, President Truman fixed each of us with a fiery glare, pointed after Churchill and whispered, that man saved the world. Lose. <laughs> and he said, for the rest of the night, they were folding with full houses and flushes. And Churchill walked away convinced that he was just a, a virtuoso at poker, <laughs> winning with these terrible hands. <laughs> I love that. Just let you know how uh, even the greatest among us have our bad moments, I, I, I guess. So uh, what are some of the lingering effects of Harry S. Truman's presidency that we could still feel to the 21st besides NATO? He was the one who laid the foundations for confrontation with communism around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and really the, the victory of the Cold War under Reagan would not have been possible without Harry Truman saying that the United States was going to oppose uh, the spread of communism. And also the fact that South Korea is still a free and democratic country is largely due to the fact that Truman was the one who decided to intervene when North Korea invaded in the summer of 1950. And also uh, the fact that the military is still subordinate to the president and not superior to him. A lot of that goes back to President Truman's decision in the middle of the Korean War to fire General MacArthur, which was a tremendously unpopular decision. I mean, he, he his approval rating shot down to about 27% after he fired MacArthur, but nearly every historian today said it was the right thing to do. So uh, Truman, at the end of his second term, he was uh, pretty unpopular uh, because of firing MacArthur, because of the Korean War. He actually, they had passed the 22nd Amendment, which term limited the president two terms. But since Truman was in office, it didn't apply to him. He could have run in 52, but oh, okay. he recognized he would win if he did. And so he agreed to abide by that and stepped down. And in 52, Dwight Eisenhower was elected president. Now, uh, Ike was a five-star general. He was, uh, you know, he was the commander of the European theater during World War II one of the most beloved generals in American history. And also, uh, Ike was a pretty good politician. I mean, he was there in Europe. He had to work with Churchill and De Gaulle and Stalin and all these other people and keep them on the same page. And uh, he wound up able to do so. And so when he came back from the war, the Republicans at this point had been shut out of the White House for, uh, gosh, for 20 straight years. They have not won an election since 1928. They really wanted to win, and so they chose Eisenhower. And I could never be particularly Democrat or Republican, but he didn't want the Republican Party to win if they were going to be run by isolationists. He saw how important it was for America to remain involved with our European allies, involved with the UN, and to kind of be the guardian of democracy around the world. And so he agreed to run as a Republican because... Pretty much everybody knew 52 was going to be a Republican year. So Ike wins the nomination and was elected president in 1952. He served for eight years. And uh, Eisenhower presided over, of course, y'all, the 50s were a time of great peace and prosperity. Uh, and he is generally recognized. It's kind of interesting. That if you look at the historians' polls, how his stock has risen steadily. Uh, the latest C-SPAN historians poll, which was issued two years ago, ranked Eisenhower fifth all time. It was Lincoln, Washington, FDR, Theodore Roosevelt, Eisenhower, and then Truman uh, ranked as sixth. So I find it interesting that the currently recognized three of, three of the top six presidents all served back to back to back there in the middle of the 20th century. Hmm. It was a time when America was blessed with some truly strong leaders. And Eisenhower was, uh, he was America's granddad. You know, the campaign slogan was, I like I, you know, because he had that warm smile. And 
you just felt like your nice old Uncle Joe had wound up running the country. Uh, but uh, what's interesting is publicly, he was very detached. He delegated to his subordinates. He didn't always appear to know what was going on. But behind the scenes, he controlled the presidency very tightly. Uh, and it's sometimes called the hidden hand presidency because he didn't let the public see what he was doing. But uh, he did make now. The greatest criticism of Eisenhower was he could have done more for civil rights, and probably he could have, but I don't know that he could have gotten a major civil rights bill through the Senate because the Southern senators were so dead set against it. Uh, but nonetheless, he did uh, you know, uh, support the Brown versus Board of Education decision that desegregated the schools. Uh, he got us out of the Korean War that he inherited and refused to get us involved in any others, uh, even though there were conflicts around the world. He kept the nation at peace, and he was just a, a steady, calming hand at the helm uh, at a time when the nation needed it. And so in 1960, he stepped down uh, and was succeeded by John F. Kennedy. And now that was a true generational change. Kennedy was the first president born in the 20th century. Now, with Kennedy, too, there's a radical shift with the presidents as far as his youthfulness and as far as his faith. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, of course, Kennedy was the first Catholic president. Uh, there's a lot of anti-Catholic prejudice that goes way back in American history all the way to the Puritans. The only other time a Catholic had been nominated was in 1928, and that was Al Smith of New York. And unfortunately, uh, the Democratic Party at that time, their strength was strongest in the South. That's also where the distrust of Catholicism was the strongest. And so Smith lost in 1928. Uh, but Kennedy actually dealt with this just very upfront. He went down to Houston, Texas, and gave a speech in front of a bunch of Protestant ministers in which he just basically said, I support the separation of church and state. He said, my view of America is that no Catholic uh, pope or cardinal should tell the president what to do, and no president should tell any clergyman what he should or should not preach. And also, to his credit, Richard Nixon, who was running against Kennedy, also belonged to a religious minority. He was a Quaker, and Nixon refused to make Kennedy's religion an issue. And people forget today that was a squeaker of an election. I mm -hmm. mean, it was decided by one-tenth of one percent of the popular vote. And if Nixon had chosen to go nasty on Kennedy and to go after him for being Catholic and make his religion an issue— Nixon might have won. Uh, he nearly did as it was. But the thing is, he and Kennedy had served at the Senate together, and he had a certain respect for Kennedy. And so when Kennedy won, even though because the election was so close, there was talk of voter fraud, which was still a very real thing back then. There was talk of possibly asking for a recount. Nixon wouldn't have any of it. He said that would not be good for the country. And I know that kind of goes against the image of Tricky Dick and, and you know Nixon, the arch criminal. Uh, that came later on, but truthfully, Nixon conducted himself pretty honorably in that campaign and lost in a very close race, and Kennedy steps in. And Kennedy was our first celebrity president. I mean, that trend had been going, but with Kennedy, the marriage of Washington and Hollywood was pretty well complete. Uh, you know, he was young. Now, common misconception is that he was the youngest president ever. That's technically not true. He's the, oh, youngest, okay. he's the youngest man elected president uh rosa teddy roosevelt was a year younger than kennedy when he succeeded to the office uh but remember he stepped up because mckinley was shot uh but kennedy it's kind of interesting i've always thought kennedy a little bit overrated mainly because he was so young and so handsome he had a beautiful wife who was even younger than him and then he was cut down in his prime and a lot of the scandals and and tarnish of his presidency was not known during the, during the time. It only came out of the decades after his death. Uh, I recently read a very good book by my friend Stephen Knott at KNOTT. He's a first-rate American historian, and he wrote a book called Coming to Terms with John F. Kennedy. And, you know, it's like there's two schools of thought out there because the first books that were written about Kennedy were written by his staffers, and they were much all about the myth of Camelot, you know, that Kennedy's presidency was this brief shining moment when America stood tall and anything was possible. And then later on, as all the other stuff about Kennedy began to come out, 
you began to get books like The Dark Side of Camelot, which were just uh, seething exposés of all of the, you know, the women, the drugs, the illicit White House parties, the voter fraud, the corruption that was attached to the Kennedy family. As a matter of fact, that book was so one-sided that one critic labeled it the second assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, and so Knott's book was trying to come to terms, and it, he winds up saying that, you know, while Kennedy's personal behavior was reprehensible, he was actually a far better president than people realized at the time, and he did a lot of consequential things. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the possibilities of Ken Kennedy's presidency go two ways. I mean, you know, the, the, for, for years, American liberals have said, well, if Kennedy had only not been killed, there might not have been a Vietnam War, you know, and, and the 60s might not have been so turbulent. But uh, the truth is, Kennedy, uh, he was ambivalent on Vietnam. I think he told people what they wanted to hear, but I don't know that he was going to retreat from a country that we were committed to as an ally. And as far as, the, you know, the great achievements of Lyndon Johnson, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, I don't know that Kennedy had the political pull to get those things through the Senate. But, you know, the Senate was where civil rights bills went to die for 80 years. Uh, and I just don't know that Kennedy could have gotten those bills through the Senate no matter how hard he tried. But at any rate, of course, he was cut down on that dreadful day in Dallas, which, uh, as we speak, is about an hour away from my house. Well, in normal weather, it's an hour. Right now, probably about four hours if you didn't wreck all the way because we are totally iced over here in texas right now mm -hmm. but what i was going to say is uh, i've been to dealey plaza many times and it's a very it's a very somber place to realize that the president's life was ended there but then that is when linda johnson steps in and takes over and johnson is just this remarkable figure uh i mean in so many ways he was crude he was vulgar he was crooked there was so much corruption uh and yet at the same time he was a man who did some remarkable things, particularly in the field of civil rights. And that's what makes this so astonishing is that he was a Southerner. I mean, Texas was as Jim Crow as Jim Crow could get. And if you look at Johnson's protégés, Sam Rayburn in the House and uh, Dick Russell in the Senate, they were staunch segregationists who had been champing at the bit because there had been no Southerner elected to the presidency since before the Civil War, and they were so eager to get a Southerner in there, and they thought Johnson was the guy. And so Johnson had accepted the vice presidency when he couldn't get the nomination away from Kennedy in 1960. He hated being vice president. And now it's interesting, John F. Kennedy seemed to like Lyndon Johnson and treated him well. Bobby Kennedy absolutely hated Lyndon Johnson. Okay. Just detested him. Uh, but then Kennedy was cut down and Johnson became president and he actually went to all of Kennedy's people and asked them to stay on, uh, and, uh, pretty much gave them all the same speech. I need you now more than he ever did. And they agreed to grudgingly at first. Now, Bobby Kennedy was out as soon as the 64 election was over, but several others held off because they watched as Johnson surprised them. You know, I mean, a Southerner fighting for the Civil Rights Act, but because Johnson had been Senate Majority Leader for 10 years and the most capable Senate Majority Leader in history. I mean, he actually got the Senate up and working like no one else ever has. And as president, he was able to push those two civil rights bills through the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, also created Medicare, Medicaid, and Head Start. I mean, the whole great society completed what FDR had begun in transforming the way we, we relate to our government. You know, it, it turned our government into that big brother helping hand image that liberal Americans uh, holding it to to this day. Uh, and so Johnson was a tremendously consequential president. And so it's very ironic that he was destroyed politically by the same, by, by the, by his own party, by the progressive liberal wing of the party that should have been his staunchest supporters over Vietnam uh, and his decision to stand by South Vietnam and to involve us there. And of course, that led into the anti-war movement and the whole, you know, hey, hey, LBJ, how many babies did you kill today? And all of that uh, came back to Lyndon Johnson's choice uh, to try to stop North Vietnam from taking over. I mean, it came back to containment and, you know, Vietnam's a divisive subject to this day. 
Uh, some consider it, you know, the greatest American tragedy. Others consider it, you know, the the necessary war that we wound up losing anyway. Uh, at any rate, so Johnson, and it's ironic, Johnson was the last person who could have been president for more than eight years. Because when the 22nd Amendment was passed, it said that if a vice president takes over more than halfway through the president's term, uh, he can then run for re-election twice. If it's less than halfway through, he can run for only one term of his own. Since Johnson took over only 14 months, with only 14 months left to go, he could have been president for nine years and three months if he had chosen to. Uh, but uh, by 68, he was so unpopular due to Vietnam that he stepped down, and that paved the way for the election of Richard Nixon. Now, Nixon has a very popular view in the American public because he was the president that was impeached. The proceedings, rather, was impeached. Him and I think ja Jackson, am I thinking right? Uh, Actually, Nixon, okay. he had never made it to an impeachment trial. They were drawing up the articles of impeachment, and he resigned. He's the okay. only Okay, thank you for correcting me. Yeah, that's all right. It, well, impeachment is a is a take name. Was Andrew Johnson was impeached after the Civil War and fell short by one vote. And then the other three presidential impeachments happened in our lifetime with Bill Clinton in 1998 and then Donald Trump twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ain't even going to go there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I say that because what I like about your whole presentation about the presidents, particularly in the 20th century, is you're seeing the change from the original founding fathers. And for those of you who are listening, if you want to hear Lewis's presentation from last year, simply go to pjcmedia.net and look through the archives. You can find out that the president has changed now. So they were more simple, simplistic, and more down to earth than they become. And so you have this shift happening where the president becomes not just a part of the people, but he's the voice of the people, the the eyes of the people. People look to the president and that kind of defines the country, kind of like a king, but not quite, you know. So there's fascinating things going on here. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, and this is what Stephen Knott's whole book, The Lost Soul of the American Presidency, talks about. We went from a constitutional presidency where the president's job was actually to kind of rein in public opinion at times and to basically make sure that democracy does not become the tyranny of the majority. And we've gone from that to the presidency just being an extension of democracy to the president becoming simply the voice of the people, uh, no matter how loud or angry or wrong the people may sometimes be. It's no longer the president's job to say, hey, bring it in for a minute. Let's think about this. Instead, it's more, well, this is what the people want, so let's do it. And if you disagree... Well, you're either with us or against us, you know, that we've we've kind of seen a transformation there. And, uh, you know, Linda Johnson was one uh, and, and also the dignity of the office. I mean, you know, George Washington and the earlier presidents conducted themselves with great dignity. They deliberately kind of kept themselves a little bit aloof from the people. They didn't divulge their private lives to the people. They they wanted the dignity of the office to be something, you know, that was worthy of a head of state. We've gone from that now to presidents, uh, you know, uh, you know, LBJ was incredibly crude and vulgar. And we've gone, you know, presidents who talk about personal health issues, uh, you know, presidents who, uh, you know, it, it, it's, we've come to expect it. We want our president to be a real guy like us, whether it's Obama shooting hoops or Bill Clinton playing the saxophone on their Arsenio Hall show. Uh, or, you know, it's, it's oh, my gosh. The, the dignity of the office has taken a hit. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> so he just said that, like, oh, my gosh, that did happen. And I think this is significant when we go through these presidents. I think it's a significant part of the conversation. Yeah. And, and you know, and some have tried. I mean, you know, uh, uh, LBJ would call people into the bathroom while he was sitting on the toilet and dictate letters to his secretaries while he was sitting there going to the bathroom, you know, nice. he was, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and yet at the same time, this, this crude vulgar guy got some his significant stuff done. I must admit last year, I read through Robert Caro's uh, four volume biography of LBJ. And it really is fascinating when you're done. You really don't know if you hate the guy or love it because he did some incredibly cheap, lonesome, corrupt things. 
and also did some incredibly great things. Uh, and you're like, wow, this guy is, uh, he's something else. Uh, but he was succeeded by Nixon. Now, Nixon was never one. Uh, Nixon was very uncomfortable in his own skin, so to speak. He had a hard time unbending in front of anybody. You know, he was uh, kind of, uh, and and when he did, it came across incredibly awkward. <laughs> you know, Nixon, uh, at one point, he went on the popular show laughing, trying to boost his approval rating with young people. And it is just almost painful to watch this president who was just not a funny man trying to be funny. But the problem with Nixon is that while, you know, foreign policy-wise, he had earned his chops. He had been vice president for eight years. He was a incredibly intelligent, wrote a ton of books on foreign policy. But the two things about Nixon, number one, he was deeply paranoid and had this persecution complex and he was going to go after his enemies. Uh, and then the other thing is he didn't have a lot of respect for the rule of law. He spied on his political enemies and, of course, ultimately he got caught in Watergate. And it's ironic, Richard Nixon in 1972 was reelected by one of the biggest landslides in American history. I think he won something like 48 out of 50 states. I mean, it was just this incredible landslide and almost 60% of the popular vote. I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. But within two years, he resigns from the office in disgrace with an approval rating in the mid-30s. I see. Um, but it was because during that election, he used political operatives to spy on his political opponents. And got caught, you know, the whole Watergate break-in thing. Uh, and uh, it was found out that these guys were all working for the committee to re-elect the president. And the scandal itself was bad enough, but the cover-up. Uh, Nixon authorized these burglars to be paid $2 million to keep their mouths shut and take their jail sentence. And in 1973, that was a lot of money. Uh, but ultimately, it all came down, of course, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. Uh, you know, they uh, they got to the bottom of the story uh and bob woodward's been writing books about the american presidency ever since but the evidence was so overwhelming uh that as the house was preparing to draw up articles of impeachment the senate took a vote and said based on what we know now how many of us would vote for impeachment and you know a two-thirds majority which is 66 or 67 senators is the requirement 75 senators said based on what they already knew they would vote to convict and the Republicans who are in a minority, there are only about 40 Republican senators in the Senate at that time. They walked up the hill and met with the president and said, Mr. President, you have to resign. Otherwise, you are going to be impeached and convicted and will be the first American president to be involuntarily stripped of power. Hmm. And Nixon protested. And one of the things he said, uh, because LBJ had died the month before on his ranch in Austin, Nixon said, you don't understand, there are no living ex-presidents. There's not a single person in the world that I can talk to who has been where I've been. But nonetheless, you know, they were firm, and Nixon agreed to back down. Uh, and so the next day, he announced his resignation. And here's where it gets weird. Gerald Ford, who followed Nixon, and Ford is really the first president that I have some fairly strong memories of. I, I remember Nixon resigning. And I remember him being president. I remember hearing all about Watergate, even though I was too young to know what it was. Ford is one of the ones that I actually kind of remember. He became president of the United States without ever being elected to the presidency or the vice presidency. That's why his term is so short, because it doesn't last very long, because he just took over after Nixon resigned from the... Okay. What happened when they passed the 22nd Amendment, up until that point, if the vice president succeeded to the presidency, which had happened at that point eight times, as president, he would serve without a vice president till the next election. And when they passed the 22nd Amendment, they said, you know, that's just a little too much of a power vacuum to leave. So part of the 22nd Amendment is that if the vice president should succeed to the presidency due to the death, removal, or resignation of his predecessor, he will immediately appoint a vice president who will then be approved by both houses of Congress. Well, when Nixon was president, his vice president, Spiro Agnew, got involved in a political scandal. And so Agnew resigned before Nixon did, over a year before. Okay. Nixon was kind of like one scandal at a time. 
And so Nixon appointed a vice president named Gerald Ford, who was a congressman from Michigan, uh, to be the vice president. Uh, and then Nixon resigned. And so Ford becomes president. And Ford was a very low key guy and really is just now getting the recognition he deserves. One of the things he did about six weeks after taking office he granted an unconditional pardon to Richard Nixon for any and all crimes committed while in office because he believed that it would be divisive and counterproductive to have prosecutors going after the ex-president, even though there were many who wanted to. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was very unpopular. Uh, public opinion said that it was a corrupt bargain, et cetera. Nearly every presidential historian agrees that that was probably the best thing Ford could have done to just put Watergate behind us and move on. Um couple other things about Ford, of course, there was a tremendous recession during his presidency, which hurt his ratings even further. He did preside over the bicentennial celebration in 1976. Uh, and then he was the subject of not one, but two assassination attempts. Two weeks apart, both of the gunmen were women. Hmm. Uh, one of them was a member of the Manson gang. I remember this uh, because when Charles Manson was arrested, sent to jail, the whole Helter Skelter killings. Mm -hmm. Some of the cult members who had been, been involved in, directly involved in the killings were still free. And apparently he sent word to them that, that President Ford needed to be assassinated to trigger the great race war that he had predicted. And so uh, Lynette Fromm was the woman's name. She got a pistol and got within 10 feet of the president, pointed it at him and pulled the trigger before the Secret Service could tackle her but she had never handled a firearm before, and she had the safety on. Wow. And as they tackled her to the ground, she said it didn't go off. And so she was arrested, and then a, about two weeks later, Ford was out in California getting ready to speak, and a woman in the crowd drew a gun and pointed it at him, and right before she pulled the trigger, the man in front of her saw the gun over his shoulder and just threw his arm up and knocked her aim off, and the bullet went over Ford's head. But I actually remember both of those back to back because like, wow, who is gunning for our president? Uh, wow. Ford ran for re-election. And of course, by that time, after Vietnam, after Watergate, after the 60s, after the 70s, the whole country pretty much didn't care anymore. I remember our neighbor had a bumper sticker that said, don't vote. It only encourages them. Hmm. Okay. But, uh, and so Jimmy Carter, who was a... Navy veteran and a peanut farmer from Georgia who had served two years as governor of Georgia throws his hat in the ring and winds up winning the Democratic nomination uh, over Ted Kennedy. Uh, and, uh, and Carter was this wonderfully honest man, literally a Sunday school teacher. And he would go out and greet the crowds. And what he would say is, my name is Jimmy Carter. I'm running for president, and I promise I'll never lie to you. Okay. And it worked. People were ready for a change, and Carter was, I mean, I, I don't know who disliked him more, the Republicans or the Democratic establishment, because he was <laughs> not supposed to be the nominee. He had never served in Washington. He was a complete outsider. And Carter is one of the best ex-presidents in American history. He is widely respected and beloved around the world for his work and building homes for the poor and fighting for democracy and, and just a host of very worthy things. But at the same time, uh, his presidency was just an exercise in frustration. Nothing went right. Uh, he was, uh, <laughs> my grandmother said he was the Danny white of American presidents. Danny white. Was oh, that a, is awful. I know who Danny white is. That is awful. Yeah, quarterback for the Cowboys who just, uh, <laughs> would stage these brilliant comebacks and almost win. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and and I mean, that was Jimmy Carter. I mean, first he had a, a horrible economic recession that hit, and then uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and we were powerless to stop them. And then the Iranian hostage crisis. And I was in high school by this time, and I remember the hostage crisis just sucked the life out of Carter's presidency. And, and not only that, he also tried to be this folksy, down-to-earth president who was in touch with the people. And Americans needed someone to look up to. You know, they needed someone to restore the dignity of the office after Nixon. They didn't need, you know, a, a buddy in the White House. And 
even did a call-in radio show on Saturdays where people could call in and talk to the president. He talked about his problems with hemorrhoids and things like that. Oh and, my goodness! <laughs> and, and then when uh, when the you know when the hostage crisis came, Carter tried to send uh, a, a relief force in there to rescue the hostages. Two of the helicopters collided. Eighteen Americans died. The Iranians wind up dragging the wreckage of our helicopter through the streets and celebrating. It was awful. Uh, and uh, then Carter basically gave the, the famous malaise speech, although he didn't use that word, where he basically scolded the American people for having a crisis of confidence that was unwarranted uh, and uh, basically blamed the American people for their own trouble. His own vice president said, if you give that speech, you're kissing away any chance at reelection. And about this time, Ronald Reagan came along out of California. And Reagan, of course, people like to point out, was an actor, and yes, he was. He had also kind of become the voice of conservative middle-class America. And the thing about Reagan was he just radiated this sunny optimism, uh, as well as uh, uh, just a lot of humor. Reagan could be funny, but he was very rarely ugly with it. You know, he, he tended to joke about his opponents in such a way as to make them laugh. And uh, I remember at the first debate with President Carter, uh, Carter was going on and on about how the numbers of Reaganomics didn't add up. And after, and you know, that Reagan, uh, I think, uh, oh, he said that Reagan had, had not wanted to support Social Security or, no, it was Medicare, that Reagan had been against Medicare. And when Carter finished his statement, Reagan just looked at him with a little quirky smile and said, there you go again. Wow. Because I was 16 at the time, mm -hmm. and for the next few weeks in my school, if somebody started trash-talking you, you just looked at them and did your best possible Reagan imitation and say, there you go again. Oh, my goodness. So that became and like a thing. <laughs> when 16-year-olds are quoting a 69-year-old presidential candidate, he's got something going for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then he talked about the United States being in a depression, and Carter publicly chided him for not knowing the difference between a recession and a depression. And Reagan shot back in his next interview, of course I know the difference. A recession is when your neighbor loses his job. A depression is when you lose your job. And oh my goodness. <laughs> Carter loses his job. Oh my, oh my gosh. That, oh man. I can, you know, it's funny that you say these things and I'm listening to them. I only have very vague thoughts about Reagan because I was not born during that time. If I was, um, it would have been a non secretary type of thing because I'm a child. You know? A little. <laughs> yeah, a little, little, little. But it's fascinating to hear this. And as you're talking and giving your presentation, what's fascinating is how you see the presidency changing over the years, which I find incredibly fascinating as we continue it. So after Reagan, who's next? Well, let's let's talk about Reagan as president. For just, I know we're running sure. out of time, but a couple sure. of things real quick. So he wins in a pretty big victory over Carter. And a month into his presidency, Reagan was shot in the chest by a would-be assassin. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was a very close call. The bullet stopped within an inch of his heart. One of his lungs collapsed. Doctors later said if he had been just a few minutes later getting in surgery, they couldn't have saved him. Wow. But what was amazing is when they got him to the hospital, his wife Nancy was waiting as they rushed him into emergency surgery, and he looked up at her and said, Honey, I forgot to duck. My goodness. And then wow. as they went to put the anesthesia on him to knock him out so they could remove the bullet from his chest, he held his hand up and the surgeon said, what is it, Mr. President? And Reagan said, please tell me you're a Republican. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and the wow. doctor looked down at him and said, today, Mr. President, we are all Republicans. Yes. <laughs> oh, my and gosh. That's the thing. Reagan brought back a lot of dignity to the presidency. I mean, mm -hmm. he understood that Americans wanted a president they needed to lead up to, and he was inspiring. I mean, you look at uh, some of his speeches, the speech on the Space Shuttle Challenger went down, his speech about the Challenger 7, mm -hmm. his speech on the 40th anniversary of D-Day. He was the most brilliant speaker. See, I, I don't remember Kennedy, okay? I was born a month after JFK was assassinated. I remember Reagan as the greatest speaker in the White House. I still go back sometimes and listen to his old speeches. I mean, 
he inspired me. He made a Republican out of me uh, when I was still in high school. Uh, and I respected him so much. And yeah, he made his mistakes. The big thing, of course, was the whole Iran-Contra scandal. And the economics of the Reagan administration have drawn a lot of criticism to this day. But nonetheless, he won re-election in 84. He won 49 out of 50 states. So that's not think- bad. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he lost Minnesota, which was Walter Mondale, his opponent's home state. He lost Minnesota by 4,000 uh, points or 4,000 votes, and he lost the District of Columbia, which always votes Democratic, and that was it. Massachusetts voted for Reagan. California voted for Reagan. He had a troubled second term, but he also began negotiating with Gorbachev towards the end of the Cold War. And then when Reagan stepped down, he was succeeded by George H.W. Bush. Now, I remember and, uh, this guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Papa Bush, as we call him down here in Texas, he was uh, he was a different sort of cat. Mm-hmm. He wasn't as popular or as affable as Reagan. He had a hard time grasping what he called the vision thing of the presidency. But he also was probably one of the best foreign policy presidents in history. I don't think anyone was better equipped to handle the end of the Cold War than Bush Sr. was. And also, uh, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, he had been vice president for eight years, visited nearly every country on earth, had a Rolodex full of the numbers of every possible foreign leader. He put together a multinational coalition, and Saddam Hussein was driven out of Kuwait. Kuwait was liberated, and Bush actually registered a 90% approval rating right after Operation Desert Storm concluded. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, uh, everybody thought he was a shoe in for re-election. And so most of the uh, most of the Democratic bigwigs refused to run uh, in uh, 92 because they just knew that Bush was going to be reelected. And so a little known Arkansas governor named Bill Clinton jumped into the race. And so did a Texas billionaire by the name of Ross Perot. Yes. Oh, my know. gosh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and gosh. Is, I still don't think Clinton would have won a too bad race. But Perot got 18 percent of the popular vote. And. He tapped into a lot of the anger and discontent over the Bush, uh, you know, Bush being perceived as being aloof and remote and not connected enough with the American people. And yet people who wouldn't vote Democrat, a lot of Southerners who uh, did not vote for, you know, a liberal Democrat from Arkansas, they would vote for Ross Perot. And so it wound up Clinton got 42 percent, Ross Perot got 18 percent, and Bush uh, got around 30 something percent so it was a uh, uh, 37 percent i think so bush got voted out and bill clinton came into office and we'll kind of wrap up with him tonight <laughs> bill clinton is incredibly charismatic i've known a lot of people who've talked to him and the thing about it they say is if you talk to him in person you just can't help but like the guy he is incredibly relatable and just uh really does seems very empathetic and yet there's always been uh, a, an aura of sleaze and corruption that's kind of hung over the Clintons, deservedly or not. Uh, the Republicans hated him with a passion because he was not supposed to get elected, darn it. <laughs> you know, it was supposed to be another Bush term. And here this slick talker from Arkansas comes in here playing the saxophone on Arsenio Hall and just slides into the White House. And... Uh, uh, Dave Barry described it one time, you know, the American humorist. Uh, he said that uh, basically for the next eight years, the Republicans in Congress were wily coyote, constructing these elaborate mechanisms to trap this awful president and get rid of him once and for all. And in the end, they wind up with an anvil falling on their head while Bill Clinton goes meep, meep and races off into the sunset. Oh, my. Pretty good description of the Clinton administration. I'll be honest, I never liked the guy. I thought he was sleazy and immoral. I have no patience for adulterers. Now that we're, you know, 23 years on the other side of his presidency, I can look back and say, you know what? He may have been a sleazy guy, but he got some stuff done, you know? And despite the fact that Newt Gingrich and the Republican Congress were doing their level best to get him out of office, including a failed impeachment trial, Nonetheless, they worked together and got stuff done. And the only time in my life, I'm 59 years old, the only time in my life we've ever had a balanced budget was in the last two years of Bill Clinton and then going over into the next year, the first year of Bush. 
and that was Clinton and the Republican Congress working together to reduce spending and boost revenue in a way that America was actually in the black for three years uh, instead of in the red, the way we had been for the previous 50. Uh, so really a remarkable achievement. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, Clinton kind of went out. He beat the rap in his impeachment trial, and then in his last days in office, wound up issuing pardons to all and sundry, including one to a guy that was on the FBI's 10 most wanted white-collar criminals list. Uh, and so Clinton is very much a mixed bag to this day. And, of course, he's uh, the he and Carter are the only ones we've talked about tonight that are still around. But he was the last president of the 20th century. You know, he talked about building a bridge to the 21st century in his second term, and that was kind of his campaign slogan. And what he left us with was a mess of an election in the year 2000 uh, with his vice president, Al Gore, running against George W. Bush, our governor down here in Texas. And it came down to one state. It came down to Florida. It came down to about 500 votes in Florida. And there are some who still say that Florida election was stolen and Bush wasn't legitimate. I'm not really going to get into Bush 43, but uh, the mess of the 2000 election, I think, was the beginning of the great divide that splits America in half to this day. Uh, and, you know, are we ever going to be a truly United States of America again? Well, that remains to be seen. But we are Americans, and somehow we never can help that, that niggling hope that the next occupant of the Oval Office, whoever he may be, is the one that's going to make everything right again. And I guess that optimism is perhaps the most fundamentally American thing of all. God bless America. I enjoyed this presentation, Lewis, and I was thinking of all the things you were saying about the various presidents. And as you were just telling this wonderful story of the transition of a country from a small little tiny 13 colonies to what it is now, 50 states, major player in world politics, um, makes huge headways. People look at America for many different reasons, many different things. And you just have to say, God bless America. And I love how you ended your thoughts. You said that optimism is very American because we will keep holding on because hope is what we live and hope is what we have. I think it's in our DNA. Despite all the wrinkles, all the pits, the pimples, the bubbles, we still have some good stuff going on. And I believe in that. So I'm really glad you were able to put the bookmark on our God Bless America special edition of Right Stuff today. I really appreciate all all your help and you went through you told the history so well no wonder you're such a good writer because <laughs> so, i was engrossed with every single thing you were saying and it makes me just want to dig deeper into our history one thing i liked that is a common thread throughout all of our presidents is that they're not perfect people they are flawed and it's only as you look back at their presidency, the last time you were here, we talked about the presidents. You said it takes about 30 years to get a handle on an administrator of the president's administration and its effect on the country. So I think it's a good place for us to stop here in uh, 2000 because it's going to take some time to get some more clarity. So it'll be interesting, interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years. And then maybe we can look back at 2000 and have a different view of the presidency. But until then, I want to thank you, Lewis, so much for being with me on the show today. Let me know when you finish your Lincoln book so I can have you back. And I can't wait to have you back and have you back real soon. All right. Take care. It was really fun and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank you all for our listeners out there. I hope you enjoyed our God Bless America Right Stuff edition. Part one is Mapping Out America, which was presented by Professor Jean-Pierre Isbots, and then Presidents Through the 20th Century by Lewis Smith. I hope you enjoyed this wonderful break into history. I always encourage you to do your research, too. You may find out some things. You may disagree with some of the things that both of these gentlemen have to say, but I got to tell you, it is fascinating. So God bless America and have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day. And God bless.